Welcome to this very special hearing um, of the Committee on Constitutional Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples. Uh, my name's Julian Lisa. I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee, and uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay respects to their elders past and present, and pay also respects to any other Indigenous people in the room, both from Australia and around the world. Um, this is a particularly special place in the history of Australia, obviously the former House of Representatives chamber, and 20 years ago I sat where Kevin is sitting as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, the last time we had uh, major discussions about constitutional change in this country. So it's, it's really wonderful to be back here today. Uh, on the committee with me is my co-chair, Senator Patrick Dodson from the Labor Party from Western Australia, Lou O'Brien, a National Party member from Queensland, Linda Burney, a, a Labor member from New South Wales, and Senator Rachel Seawitt, a Greens senator from Western Australia. So we are a multi-party committee. Um, the committee was established by the Australian Parliament to progress the national recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and our work is informed by the regional dialogues undertaken by the Referendum Council last year, which culminated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. As you'd be aware, the Uluru Statement recommended a First Nations voice to the Australian Parliament. Our work's also informed by the earlier work of the 2015 Parliamentary Committee and the 2012 Expert Panel on Constitutional Recognition. This hearing is being broadcast on Parliament's website, and I understand it's being broadcast live, and transcripts of the proceedings will be published on the Parliament's website as well. Those present here today are also advised that filming and recording are permitted during the hearing, and I'm also to remind members of the media who may be present or listening on the web of the need to fairly and accurately report the proceedings of the committee. Uh, this is a normal hearing of the Parliamentary Committee, even though we are out of the, the building of the Parliament. Although the committee doesn't require you to give evidence under oath, let me say to all witnesses, I advise you that this hearing is a legal proceeding of the Parliament and therefore has the same standing as the proceedings of the respective Houses. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as a contempt for Parliament. The evidence given today will be recorded by Hansard and attracts parliamentary privilege. And before I ask some of the international guests to uh, make a statement, I also just want to acknowledge and thank the ANU and the other organisers of today's First Nations Governance Forum uh, for allowing us to hold this session here as part of their conference and also to thank uh, the wonderful international speakers who will be able to help us with our deliberations here. Um, I'd like to uh, invite delegates to... Um, and other participants, if they're speaking to the committee, to introduce themselves prior to speaking. And what I might do is we have uh, four delegates who have indicated that they'd like to speak to us. I um, might ask them each perhaps to make an introductory statement, and before they do so, just introduce themselves and tell us uh, who they are and where they're from. Uh, so uh, we might start with Daly, please, and go, ar go around the table, and then, and then we'll put some questions, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this unceded territory as well as all the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders across the land and uh, more power to them in relation to their unceded territory and their unceded sovereignty. Um, my name is Daly Sambo Duro. I am a professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I have a history of uh, engagement at the international level, in particular in relation to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as the revision of ILO Convention Number 169 and uh, other various different international fora. I presently teach in the Department of Political Science at UAA in the subfield of international relations, and I'm uh, very pleased to have been invited to offer uh, some remarks and uh, appreciate the lack of preparation that I've had. So <laughs> I'll hand the microphone off to Brian. Thank you. My name is Brian Crane. Uh, I'm a lawyer from Canada. Uh, I have a, a practice which is uh, uh, mostly uh, ab Aboriginal law. And uh, over my uh, uh, many years at the bar in uh, Ottawa, I have uh, worked on uh, many uh, uh, appeals uh, to uh, all level levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. And I've also worked in the negotiation of native land claims uh, in Canada and in the negotiation of self-government agreements. 
pass the I'll get the secretary to help pass the Oh, there's a microphone there, Ken. Thank you. I, uh, thank you very much, and I, I share the honor of us uh, sort of being on unceded Aboriginal Aboriginal territory here in, in Australia. Um, and appreciate the chance to speak to you. Um, my name is Ken Coates. I'm a professor of public policy at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I'm from the Yukon in the far northern part of the country. It was one of the um, areas that has the most experience with modern treaties and the negotiation and implementation of, of modern treaties. And I specialize in um, Indigenous rights and the implementation of, of treaties and constitutional arrangements in Canada. Thank you. And uh, I, too, start with um, expressing my gratitude to the traditional um, custodians and owners of this land and that they accept me as a guest here. Uh, and I also pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and future. And thanks also uh, to the committee to allow me to, be, uh, to appear before you. Uh, my name is Matthias Ore. I come from Sweden, from the Sami people there, reindeer herding community uh, originally. Uh, and I'm now a professor of law at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. Norway, uh, I too have uh, participated for many, many years in international processes uh, on indigenous people's uh, rights. And I'm also uh, advocating some people's rights domestically, in particular when it comes to rights to land and resources. Thank you. I might just ask a, a general question and perhaps pose it to Matthias and go back round and then I'll hand over to colleagues. What do you think are the learnings from your particular jurisdiction in terms of pitfalls and strengths uh, of the approach that's been adopted to consult and engage Indigenous people on policy uh, in the same way that we're attempting to do with, with, with the potential voice proposal? What, what are the learnings we can take from you uh, about uh, engaging Indigenous people from your mechanism in your country? Well, I, I think the, the principal point I would say, uh, really to start, uh, not perhaps at the bottom, but at the basic, that it taken many years. I think uh, the experience of the Sami are similar to the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. But we are now in a point, at a point where you have formal and I would say honest recognition of the Sami as an indigenous people with self-determining rights, with the right to have uh, their voice uh, made in all matters concerning them, including at the highest level that would mean the parliament and the government. And I think a general recognition uh, among the Swedish population, if I keep to Sweden now, even though the Sami live in four countries, uh, that this is actually beneficial to the country as a whole, also to, to the Swedish population, and that there is a general understanding on that, that we try to move forward, and that this is not dangerous, this is actually helpful, and uh, really, really uh, creating an environment where you can respect uh, the, right, the indigenous rights of the Sami in this case, at the same time that this need not be of detriment to the country as a whole. Uh, some really quick observations. Um, we're getting dangerously close to a culture of over-consultation in Canada. Um, too many committees, too many meetings. The impact on the mm -hmm. Aboriginal folks is amazing. They don't get enough time. They don't get the resources to actually prepare properly. And when you add in the sort of the financial, economic, resource development consultations on top of all the policy ones, um, it becomes a real challenge. So it has to be a question of balance. Um, I think we have to also recognize that uh, the thing that distinguishes uh, indigenous policy in Canada is consistent policy failure. Um, there's not about a lot of strong background to say, wow, this is, aren't we lucky we get to help develop policy. Policy has been a hammer that's been used for 150 years. And so the whole concept of being involved with policy development is something a lot of indigenous people in Canada view with some great concern uh, because it's a means of control and oftentimes manipulation. Um, that said, you will not get a substantial improvement in government policy and outcomes from government policy without engagement. Uh, it's happening now. Uh, Canada, I think, is moving toward what I describe as a co-production of policy model, where even in the allocation of resources and budgetary considerations, there are, right now at this point, behind the scenes and informal consultation. Mm -hmm. and the policies that come out have actually been, when I say pre-approved, pre-approved, uh, pre-approved, that doesn't really capture it because there's no formal approval mechanism. But um, you'll find in the last couple of years in particular, the indigenous folks have not been reacting negatively to policy 
formulations because they've actually been involved in developing them and in setting priorities. And I think setting priorities is perhaps as much as, as, as anything else. Um, and so I think the, the final thing I would say is that in Canada we're actually learning to trust Indigenous folks, to trust them to manage their own affairs, which has been a long time coming, trust them to make informed and, and useful contributions to Canada as a whole. And I think one of the things we're discovering is that Indigenous expectations around consultation are expanding beyond their immediate, their immediate issues to other national issues, and that's been quite fascinating as well. Ken, could you just explain the how in terms of consultation just before we go to Well, first off, the, the major part of consultation is having a government official show up in your, in your community with a briefcase and a suit um, and say, I'm here to consult with you. And these are, you know, formalized meetings with communities, with bank councils and things of that sort. We have a lot of those going on. Um, the Assembly of First Nations and the other national indigenous organizations meet routinely with government. They used to do it in a fairly high, highly politicized environment. They're doing it much more in a quiet behind the scenes a sort of process, a process now. Um, and they're actually taking, there have been a series of issues on, for example, resource revenue sharing and on resource development where they actually joined a joint committee of Indigenous Affairs in the House of Commons and actually then with the Indigenous organizations to plan together the best way of going forward. So it exists at a whole bunch of different levels. When I talk about over consultation, to me that means yet another government official coming to the community yet mm -hmm. again to have another conversation. Mm -hmm. That is wearing um, and the amount of, they don't have the time and resources to prepare for it. The other, the national and regional level consultations are going much, much better. Um, and we're now, the federal government is trying to regionalize them. They've moved away from the idea there's a single national policy that will work for everywhere. And they're moving toward this idea of what, find regional groups. They might be cultural centered, they might be geographically centered. Um, and those kind of more informal but very intense um, sort of policy development processes are, I think, proving to be quite, quite successful. I just wanted to say that there's a, a, a very big uh, legal dimension to uh, the consultation debate in Canada. And that is that uh, in 2004, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, in a case called Haida, uh, Haida people from Haida Gwaii in Western uh, British Columbia, uh, uh, decided that uh, government could not uh, approve a, uh, a, an authorization for a tree license uh, without consulting with the Aboriginal group. Uh, prior to the Haida case, um, consultation had been uh, not regarded as a legal duty, <coughs> but a good, an important public policy <coughs> that should be followed. In the Haida case, uh, the Supreme Court said, no, it is a duty if, in a case where the Aboriginal group uh, has made a claim, even though the claim may not have been resolved by the courts, even though there may be a debate as to whether it was a solid claim or not. If there is a reasonable prima facie claim, then the government has the response, and, and government must approve the project, then government must engage in consultation. And that rule has sort of overlaid all the consultation activity. Now, it, now industry uh, and mining industry, oil and gas, uh, uh, natural resources, uh, res renewable resource energy, all of those projects mm -hmm. now, uh, industry is going directly to the communities as a first step and is engaging in consultation in advance of the approval. And uh, it's so it's, it's almost, uh, it's now it's built in to the approval process. All administrative tribunals have a duty to, to see that consultation has been done. Is there a specific mechanism they have to use or it's, you know, that depends on the particular people that you're consulting with? So, sorry, I missed. Do, do they have to use a particular consultative mechanism, or it's just uh, it's up to the parties to, to determine? I think it's regarded as a fact situation in a case by case basis. That if it's a uh, if it's a uh, taking of land, uh, then it will require deep, extensive consultation. If it's a question of some interference in harvesting rights, uh, fishing, hunting, uh, gathering, some slight interference then it may not be that sort of deep consultation, but more uh, 
in the nature of giving notice, giving an opportunity to put your side of the question forward. All the land claim agreements now that are being negotiated have detailed descriptions of consultation, when it's required and when it's not required. So what, with the consultation, can I just jump in, sorry? Yes, with, the, with the consultation, well, don't, don't, does, don't there, it, does there need to be approval? I mean, we hear about consultation all the time, but unless there's actually a level of approval or rejection, the capacity to reject it, what? The trigger is for it? consultation is if, first, that the, the native group has a has has rights or it has asserted a claim. Uh, the um, uh, if if government is contemplating a uh, or has to legally give approval to a project, mm. then consultation so is. So can people say no? Is the bottom line. The there is no veto, but if the if a if an Aboriginal group has a legal right such as by an established treaty or a previous court case or something of that sort, then there is an effective veto. But it's only in those cases where the right has clearly established and there is, a, there is going to be some impact on that right. They can then say no. In, in that situation. In that situation, consent would be required. Yeah. Okay. Tony, what can we learn from Alaska? Thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I think um, it, it, rather than taking it to the context of Alaska, let me answer the initial question that you posed about, um, about ways forward in relation to consultation. I think one of the first issues is recognizing the status of the people's concerned, meaning that there is clear and explicit recognition of the, the rights and the status of the indigenous peoples that you're going to engage with. Just straight up, clear recognition of the status and rights. And on the part of indigenous peoples, their status and rights are inherent in their status as indigenous peoples, as distinct peoples. Earlier today, there was a bit of a discussion, especially in relation to the UN Special Rapporteur on minorities, about uh, minorities and political rights. And I think it's essential that we recognize um, in Australia, in the United States, in Canada, in the Philippines, in the Congo, wherever it happens to be, that indigenous peoples and their individual and collective rights are distinct from all others. And by this, I specifically mean their political right to self-determination as a collective right. In addition, it's essential to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples to their lands, territories, and resources, which is quite distinct from minorities. Um, the Special Rapporteur made a reference to numerical minorities, and I think that in relation to indigenous peoples, these things have to be very clear, very explicit. In addition, um, as far as um, the, the question is concerned, specifically consultation, there should be clear and explicit recognition that the indigenous peoples concerned have the right to participate in decision making. <coughs> and throughout, for example, the course of negotiating the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we attempted to clarify that even further by inserting terms like meaningfully, effectively, directly. You get the point that the, 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 the right to participate in decision making is essential. And Earlier today, maybe you were present, I don't, I don't know, um, one of the uh, panel speakers, uh, uh, Patrick in particular, uh, referenced nothing without us, that, that it's essential to have participation at every, every juncture, at every step of the way. And I don't think it's necessarily as, as fine-tuned as determining the uh, uh, the legal content, but 
Brian has just now made reference to on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and Ken has made reference to um, uh, overwhelming indigenous uh, peoples in their communities and their representatives with uh, far too much consultation. I think these, these questions are really um, within the purview and the authority of the peoples concerned to determine whether they are um, being overwhelmed with consultation. When it comes to the issue of the right to free prior and informed consent, I think it is much better for us to think of this in terms of a discussion, a dialogue, a negotiation, and the ability and the capacity of the indigenous peoples concerned to either give their consent or withhold their consent. I don't think that it's really necessarily accurate to utilize the term veto, but uh, maybe Brian can also tell us a little bit more about the Chilcotin case in relation to the rights of indigenous peoples to their lands, territories, and resources, and how free prior and informed consent is triggered and uh, has been uh, elucidated by the court um, to apply to a wide range of things. But uh, I just want to caution about the, the use of the term veto, um, mm -hmm. because that's not referenced, for example, in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I think it was the Indigenous Peoples concerned in that particular case who had to point that out. Um, sorry to be long-winded about it, but I think these are essential elements in terms of moving forward as far as a, a dialogue and uh, negotiation and discussion with Indigenous Peoples here or elsewhere. Um, thank you all for um, sharing uh, those opening statements and um, being with us today. I mean, obviously, the task of this committee, of the parliament, of both houses, all parties, is an incredibly complex one, incredibly complex. Um, and we will make recommendations and then it will be a debate within the parliament as to where things go. What I would like to ask you is something fairly specific. If we're talking about um, responding to the Uluru Statement, which essentially called for, the only thing it called for in terms of constitutional reform was within the Australian Constitution, a voice to the Parliament of First Peoples would be established. Constitutions in this country are notoriously difficult to get up. So my question is, what would you respond to with, with saying, well, we'll go to a, have a referendum, it could, get lo it could be lost or it could, it could be successful, versus the idea, but you can't get rid of the voice, versus the idea of a legislated body? So either constitutional reform, which might or might not be successful, or a legislative body within the parliament, which can be done away with, with a change of government or minister. In some, and, and we've had that experience. Well, uh, first, I'm mostly here to of my experience within law, and this is more of a strategic question for, for Australia, I think. But if I should still make an attempt uh, coming here and being informed on this whole event, and then I don't mean this committee meeting, but mm. the, the conference, and uh, the, the strong focus on a constitutional change, uh, I was thinking in the same lines, that mm -hmm. uh, taking the Nordic countries as an, ex as an example, um, I think certainly it would have been, we have constitutional recognition in Sweden, Norway, and Finland right. of, of this army. In, in various ways, in in, uh, in Sweden as a people, in Finland as an indigenous people, and in Norway more um, in a more cloudy language. Uh, but in Sweden and Finland, explicit recognition of this army as a people. Within the constitution? In the constitution. And I would uh, strongly recommend that, because I think that has, or I don't think, I know, that that has uh, legal implications under law. The, <coughs> as with the status of people come the right to self-determination, uh, to be implemented through certain forms of uh, autonomy, which would mm. 
by definition, have a direct relationship with the uh, Australian main government and, mm. and parliament. But I think it <coughs> would be a bit difficult if you, as I would say, that's what I would recommend, and I think what the uh, Aboriginal people of Australia are entitled to uh, under law. Uh, politically, in, in the Nordic countries also, uh, perhaps it would be difficult to move directly from uh, a relatively low point to constitutional recognition and probably th there were legislation and so on to similar effects yeah. before that. These legislation were never repealed. They are still there. Then it was just confirmed strongly by, in, uh, by a constitutional change to have this kind of recognition or rather the basis of why we have Sami parliaments that have autonomy power uh, that uh, have a direct, through law, established link, uh, how they deal with the government and parliament of Sweden, Norway, Finland, and so on. That is not out in a law, and that happened before. And then came the constitutional right. recognition of the Sami as a people, as an indigenous people, because that is really what these laws and the Sami parliaments, the establishment of the Sami parliament that, uh, as uh, organs through which the Sami people exercise autonomy within the constitutional systems of Sweden, Finland, and Norway, and so on, but with a formalized relationship mm. with the government, the Swedish government, the Swedish parliament, and so on. And I think this might be some kind of system that you want uh, look like look at, because as I said, there are clear similarities between, between the situation of the Sami and the situation of the Aboriginal peoples in, in Australia. And, uh, but the law with the parliaments and, and the, um, uh, how this work in, in practical way come first, then came the constitutional recognition to say this is really what this is established on, the recognition of the Sami as an indigenous people. It's and very the people. helpful, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll try to be really quick. Um, first off, remember in Canada we have a whole suite of Supreme Court decisions, uh, uh, we referred to them already, that have had a huge impact on changing the conversation in, in, in our country. Um, and they continue to add to them. So First Nations people keep winning most of the court cases. Um, having the constitutional protection has been of huge importance in Canada um, because it, it um, signifies their real participation in the country in a sort of a guaranteed way. Uh, though their modern treaties and things like that are constitutionally protected, it gives real substance. And for indigenous folks, I'm not indigenous myself, for indigenous folks, they, they put an awful lot of uh, in emphasis on the fact that they have those kinds of, of, of guarantees. Um, in the reality world of sort of, if you couldn't have a constitutional amendment, mm. would you go for the legislative uh, step? I would go for the legislative step, but I would not just create a sort of a uh, administration of poverty model yeah. where you create some sort of a bureaucracy that just manages indigenous affairs. If you can create a legislative step, that actually has real authority and real engagement in that co-production of policy model, um, I think it's, it's really important. Um, so I, it's sort of a balance of those kinds mm -hmm. of things. If you, it'd be terrible not to get the constitutional change, but it would be even worse to lose it. Mm. I just wanted to make the, um, the quick comment that um, with regard to a reference in the Constitution as one of the, I mean, the central pivotal instrument uh, would allow uh, for the uh, opportunity as it has in Canada and the United States, um, uh, despite the, the, the wording uh, and the reference um, uh, within the U.S. Constitution to uh, Indian nations, um, it's, it's fairly limited, it would at least afford the wording in the Constitution to transcend all areas, executive, legislative, and judicial. And I think this is um, uh, something that would be very important mm -hmm. um, for all day-to-day -day matters concerning indigenous peoples here in Australia. And the other thing I think is important to say is that um, th this committee and your, your mandate um, that the opportunity to be as comprehensive as possible um, and through, for example, this conference um, 
cataloging the various different approaches um, and being uh, coherent in that regard um, is an important exercise yeah. and to, and to um, think beyond the Constitution or a legislative body. I, I fully appreciate what uh, individuals have said with regard to um, the difficulties uh, and the history here. Mm -hmm. Um, but societies can change, and so the opportunity to be comprehensive <coughs> now uh, may, in fact, trigger change that is um, uh, vital and progressive and positive in the future. Uh, the, um, the government of Canada t attempted uh, in the 1980s to uh, have another amendment to the Constitution to um, guarantee the Aboriginal right to self-government. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, went to a referendum, and for various political reasons, it was defeated. Mm -hmm. At that point, the politicians uh, laid down their tools and said, not, not in this generation. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they did do is uh, the the government uh, adopted a policy uh, called the self-government policy, uh, which said that the government was prepared to negotiate self-government arrangements, and there was a whole suite of, uh, of, of alternatives that were set out in that, uh, in that document, and uh, listing some powers that could not be uh, transferred to um, a uh, indigenous government, and some powers that uh, could be discussed, and others that certainly mu must be transferred. Yeah. So there was a, a, an approach there of a menu of options, and uh, that policy has resulted in a large number of yeah. self-government agreements. Um, and uh, those agreements have ranged from what might be called a, a local municipal model, which would add culture and language and uh, indigenous uh, uh, values to, to what was a local government, right. to a regional government, uh, to particular arrangements in, in the sectors, such as education mm -hmm. or health management, uh, which would be done on a tribal basis or a, a regional basis, and it has also resulted in mixed models, which uh, have an element of public government in mm. them, and so that if the residents of a community have non-Aboriginal people, mm. those people would have a vote for the local council. So there's there's a lot of options out there, and that is the, so there is no uh, legislation except at the end of the process. At the end of the process, the self-government agreement can be approved by Parliament and given uh, treaty status. Right. So at the end of the process, it has become recognized constitutionally on an individual case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and again, thank you for making yourselves available. It's uh, really valuable for us to get first-hand uh, information from people like yourselves in the field and uh, working across this field. Um, I've got a couple of questions. As people who've come to Australia, what do you see has been the impact of the two High Court cases of Mabo and Wick, if you're familiar with them, into that, uh, that have uh, really challenged our sense of uh, terra nullius in this, in this nation state? Mabo particularly, and WIC, of course, setting up the capacity to have a concurrent right uh, with pastoral lease holdings, uh, but yielding. But what, what do you see as, if, if you're familiar with those cases, if you're not, I'll move on to something else, but what do you see with those cases, looking at Australia's political fabric, any evidence of us responding to that in the way that your nations, states, seem to have done in relation to you, to the First Nations? I'm not sure this is a question for Brian or Matthias or, or anyone of you. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I can be very brief. I, I'm not familiar very well with the big case. I will not speak to that, but somewhat with the marble at least. And obviously, has been spoken to by many before in these two days. I've been a, a very critically important principal case getting rid of this terminalist principle and so on and acknowledging that Australia was indeed inhabited and subject to rights before uh, the English population arrived. So very principal, uh, principally important case, but I further understand uh, in, in my reading that the problem with it is that it's loaded with caveats uh, that makes it not as important from a practical perspective when you have this burden of proof, very high burden of proof on establishing customer law existing at the time uh, of, of colonization and uh, existing still today. I mean, that's an enormous burden of proof for any community to, to do. So its practical relevance, um, I think, is limited quite severely with those caveats. And I, I would remind that under international law or customer law does apply in Australia, basically what is needed is simply traditional use. Traditional use of the land by the community without having to go through this process of proving this existence of customer law. Uh, so I, I, I would hope that Australian courts and so on would uh, go in that direction in, in line with the international law. So really quickly, um, I've been down in Australia a lot, and mostly in the Northern Territory and Western Australia over the, the time, and uh, I'm absolutely astonished at how little Mabo has affected policy and action. Um, just in, co in a comparison to the Canadian context, which I think Senator was your question, um, you think that Mabo should be one of these things that just change the way people see the world, and changes just have ripple effects through the society. Um, I'll just do a con comparison. You mentioned uh, Taku, Taku and, uh, and Haida, the two agreements in 2000, two court decisions in 2004. Um, they changed the way the resource industry in Canada operates profoundly. Um, and actually, most people who act under them have never read them. They go, okay, we have to do we have to duty consult, that's part, and accommodate, which means that even the slightest problem for the communities has to be addressed through financial compensation, additional land, jobs, employment, et cetera, et cetera. We now have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of agreements between Aboriginal communities and resource companies as a consequence of those two decisions. And when I first heard of, I used to know, I knew Henry Reynolds, who was involved with the Mabo decision very extensively. And the hopes and expectations behind Mabo mm -hmm. were just right through the roof. And I've been really surprised that they haven't been internalized, that people haven't looked at those and said, this really does change the fabric of the country. Um, and again, the surprise comes mostly from what happened in Canada because those decisions have been transformative and we've sort of taken it as a guide, so well, okay, that's, we took the wrong path, let's go down this way. I think, just quickly, the denunciation of, uh, of terra nullius as a doctrine, um, that it signaled high hopes for everyone. And the other footnote to this is uh, um, that though it had immediate um, uh, impact here, let's not forget the, the borrowing of jurisprudence by countries across the globe and, and the real danger of that uh, as well. As an outside observer, um, the denunciation, but also um, uh, the, the opportunity to create a wedge as far as native title uh, is concerned. Um, from afar, I simply saw the legislative diminishment of the case. Uh, that that you you had you had the decision, and then uh, the opportunity uh, for it to just be legislated away and diminished uh, in phenomenally from from my point of view, and I and I would agree with what Matthias Aaron has said about um, the the high standards set uh, when we're talking about inherent rights uh, and title to land. Um, so from afar, it was, it was actually a bit akin to some of the developments in Alaska where, um, in, in fact, it was <coughs> somewhat a, a reverse of some of the developments in Alaska uh, in relation to the question of Indian country. 
um, that um, in, in the ninth, the Venati decision, the Ninth Circuit Court uh, found in favor of Alaska Native people and instantly the, the Congress and others were trying to figure out how can we legislate this out of mm -hmm. existence. Um, and which then suggests a, a really politically volatile arena. Absolutely. Maybe this other question is probably a bit more mundane, uh, in the sense that the, this challenge of recognition, I think, Dali, you touched on it earlier, uh, but it was also touched on now, I guess, from uh, New Zealand earlier, uh, out of the experience of the Parliament and Māori representation in the, in the Parliament. How do you deal with the question of why should First Nations peoples have a independent uh, position to the parliament of a sovereign nation? We're, we're often confronted in this committee mm. by people who say, well, why should First Nations have a, an independent position? We've heard from uh, Professor Charlesworth earlier about the uh, nature of some comments made in, in, in her speech, but we're probably still at first base on some of this, as to why should First Nations people even have a voice to the parliament, let alone entrenching it in the constitution. Mm. But why should they have a voice to the parliament? And if so, should that voice be deliberative, that is, have impact, or should it just be advisory? What? Why I think first, and both special rapporteurs I think spoke to this this morning also that the law, the international law, has changed that effect. We used to have an international law provided for political institutional rights only to bodies coming out of the state, and that meaning then the institutions or peoples understood as the aggregate populations of states. That has changed, and in particular so with regard to indigenous peoples. Now we have an understanding of people in international law where people need not only be understood in the terms of aggregate population of states, but also of populations that constitute subsegments of states, and that is definitely established um, uh, with regard to indigenous peoples, for instance, by the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, meaning that the Aboriginal peoples of Australia have this right. They have a right to exercise uh, their wishes and so on for the future, not only as citizens of Australia and through the, the political institutions available to all Australians, but through bodies particular to them, mm. uh, through which they exercise their right to self-determination in, in an autonomous way. And as I said before, that would necessarily have to include a direct relationship uh, with, um, uh, with the uh, political institutions yeah. of Australia as such. Uh, international law is not so clear as to uh, exactly how this relationship <coughs> should be, exactly what should be the mandate of this autonomous body of the First Nations. Uh, but that there is a right to such a body or bodies, uh, that is clear. And I think that from that follows an obligation of Australia to start to examine what this relationship should be. What is this body that the First Nations have or bodies mm -hmm. and what should be the relationship with the state bodies? That is an obligation that Australia have and I think the, the call coming from uh, the Aboriginal people show that there's a clear desire for such an institutional change uh, and that the fact that it's not yet established is causing grievances. And when the right is there, uh, I think there is also the obligation follows for Australia to start examine and go down this path uh, sooner rather than later. And then uh, as to exactly what would be the structure, the mandate and so on, I cannot speak to and I think there is uh, limited guidance to get from international law, but that the body, that the Aboriginal peoples are entitled to this body and that it should be there in some kind, I think is clear, and I, I think it would be advisable to, to start this process. Yeah. I, I would add as well that to, um, to not address the political right to self-determination of indigenous peoples here or 
anywhere else means that we'll continue to live with the distortion of history. And by that I mean, as I was saying earlier in relation to the right to participate, um, just on the basis of the distinct legal status of indigenous peoples as peoples with the political right to self-determination as understood in international law and its equal application. Uh, Vicki Talley Corpus and her uh, panel presentation spoke about some of the background and history uh, in order to achieve Article 3 of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And um, so it's the accuracy of history, number one. Uh, but number two, through the, through the articulation of the right to self-determination and its clear and explicit application to indigenous peoples as peoples really became a matter of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And member states that wanted to diminish or qualify it in that context were practicing racial discrimination. Indigenous peoples won the day on that issue. The UN Declaration and Article 3 is the same language found in Article 1 of the International Covenants. It is the same reference as the principle iterated in the United Nations Charter and the 1970 Declaration Concerning Friendly Relations Between States, which then also invokes criteria by which governments, states, and we didn't have a hand in creating this 1970 declaration. We weren't there, right? We weren't present when the UN Charter was being drafted. We had no hand in the 1970 declaration. Governments set for themselves, as well as the international covenants, we didn't have a hand in the writing of that. Governments set for themselves, especially in the 1970 declaration concerning friendly relations, criteria by which they can exercise the right to self-determination, including the recognition of the right to peoples within their territory. And this was what the big debate of Article 46 of the UN Declaration uh, became about. But as indigenous peoples, we ensured that elsewhere in the UN Declaration, there were provisions that balanced the language we, in fact, were the only intellectually honest representatives at the table when it came down to this debate. And so uh, I'm probably giving too much voice to your, your mundane question, but, but the, the recognition of the right to self-determination and its attachment to indigenous peoples in Australia or elsewhere um, is a matter of equality. It is a quest for equality. And uh, the opportunity to have independent uh, bodies and political institutions that are responsive to the desires and aspirations and the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, would begin to uh, correct and remove this distortion of history that we've all experienced. Yeah, just really quickly, the um, uh, First Nations and, and Métis and Inuit people in Canada have very different th opinions. This isn't a matter of huge conversation in Canada, but basically it comes down to this. There are some folks who favor what they, call the, they used to call the 11th province, that Indigenous people should be brought together into some sort of a, a provincial-like status that would cover the whole country and draw them together in one, in one sense. There's another group of Indigenous folks who think that active engagement in partisan politics is the right way to go. Um, there are probably between 12 and 15 writings in the country that could be swayed by, by, by active uh, indigenous engagement in the national political process, um, which um, 10 years ago, they didn't vote very much. It was the, the whole political process was so far removed from their life, they didn't think it was very valuable. Now they're getting more heavily involved. And so some people say, let's do this. And if you have a chance to meet Julie wilson Rabo, who's the Minister of Justice from Canada, she's uh, Aboriginal from British Columbia, mm -hmm. powerful, powerful person. And she makes a strong case. Let's get inside the system and change it sort of from the inside. Um, the third thing I would say, though, is that the modern treaties in Canada have, have really changed the conversation about what's possible and how you can proceed. So 
For example, uh, all the modern treaties guarantee Aboriginal representation, a fixed percentage on almost all the major decision-making bodies, particularly in the Yukon Northwest Territories, Nunavut's separate because it's an in in Inuit-controlled jurisdiction. Um, and so you have sort of a minimum of 40%, 40%, right, right is it, uh, representation on things like the water development boards and the economic planning boards and things of that sort. Usually 50%. Uh, 50%. 50%. So you, you have guaranteed representation on the committees and the processes that lead up to formal decision making. And so in one sense, in these environments, you have such heavy engagement of Indigenous people in local governments and regional authorities that the separate status seems kind of unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, and the transformation in the last 40 years in these northern environments has been unbelievable, with Indigenous people brought right into the formal decision-making process in a way that you're not seeing it happen in the South yet, although if you sign more treaties in the South, it'll probably change there as well. Pleasure, Louis, Brian. Gotcha. You're right. You're right. I've got a, a, a quite a, a basic uh, question, and it probably, in, in some ways, comes from my lack of knowledge in relation to your where you can't where you're from and your experiences. But our task uh, for this committee, one of our many tasks, is to come up with something that is achievable in terms of a referendum. Australians are very pragmatic people, and broader Australia, I think. I, I, I'm sure um, want to see high levels of disadvantage in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities uh, improved. Um, we, we have targets in closing the gap on education, health and employment. With your experience in relation to constitutional recognition and legal precedent uh, in your geographical areas, have you, is it the case that you've had disadvantage like we have here and has it improved? And can you speak to me about that and give me examples of the improvement? Well, I, I could, I could uh, attempt uh, a bit of an answer uh, on this, uh, in, in this way that uh, if the if the change is uh, measured in terms of a generation, there, there is indication of, Im of improvements. Uh, the, the problem is, is one partly of resources and of training. We have uh, the, uh, in the, uh, in the, we have a whole territory, none of it, which is uh, Inuit uh, dominated in terms of population. And uh, so, but uh, is, uh, there is still a great deal of poverty. Uh, there's a dislocation of communities and there is, uh, it's a long, long process. One of the commitments that was made in the land claim agreement for Nunavut was that the public service would have a target of, I forget what it was, 45%, something like that, uh, of uh, Inuit in the public service. Uh, and that was not achieved. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they had uh, more white faces around the, the, the bureaucracy, in the bureaucracy, and they weren't, they weren't able to uh, get the people. And that is a, that is a issue, a function of resources, but it's also an intergenerational thing. And uh, there's, there are communities that are weakened. So whatever scale you use, it's going to be a long, long pr program. Uh, but they are making the decisions themselves. So the, the Inuit government is making the decisions and is running the territory. And uh, there's no reason why that model can't be used uh, anywhere. Thank you. Um, two examples come to mind um, in relation to the Indian Child Welfare Act and uh, retaining children, indigenous children, Alaska Native children within our communities. We have a, we have a, a really complicated um, history just by virtue of the 
Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, yet our traditional councils and our tribal governments persist and, and uh, continue in part by virtue of uh, an amendment to the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act uh, in 1936 made applicable to Alaska Native tribes and traditional councils. And just in relation to retaining children within the community, which I understand to be a, a serious issue here, as well as across uh, uh, indigenous homelands, we've seen marked improvement, as well as, surprisingly, um, acceptance by the state of Alaska as a political subdivision of the United States government, um, uh, recognizing uh, the role and the place of the tribal courts, the indigenous courts. And some of these uh, tribal courts uh, operate and function on the basis of their traditional laws and protocol. And uh, the, the one and best example that I have uh, is um, in the community of Bethel in southwest Alaska, which is actually a, a huge village um, in contrast to other areas. Uh, they, they rewrote their tribal code on the basis of Yupik law and tradition and protocol. They then sought the best provisions in the federal law of the Indian Child Welfare Act. They then borrowed also from the Convention on the Rights of the Child and updated their code on the basis of all available uh, information out there related to child custody and retention of, of children. But their most important and, and pivotal piece of um, material for this code was their own law and, and protocol uh, that's embedded in their own Yupik language. And that has been, that's just one community. And there are other, other communities where uh, civil jurisdiction has uh, meant a great deal and, and caused, I, I think, dramatic change. Uh, of course, problems persist and, and uh, it needs tinkering and adjustment, but that in and of itself is quite significant and an, expre an important expression of internal self-government, internal autonomy, internal self-determination. The, the second area that I'll cite, which I actually am quite critical of because it led to the morphing of, um, of a of what was formerly nonprofit health corporations into so-called tribal entities by, uh, by the federal government. Nevertheless, to this day, um, and since this morphing of, uh, of these entities into tribal entities, which I object to, I think it's, this, it's, it's, it's kind of oversight and prescription that government shouldn't be involved in because of the right of self-determination. Nevertheless, they now, uh, this, this um, uh, linkage of um, these tribal entities provides the health care services and state-of-the-art health care services for all of the Alaska Native population across our entire state and runs a budget now um, certainly in excess of $100 million a year to provide essential health care services. This also means, though, that we still have problems in our rural areas where there are no health care centers. Um, but through telemedicine and other, other um, uh, avenues, hopefully this dynamic will change as well. But I, I point to those two things as, as examples where recognition of the right of self-determination and recognition that indigenous peoples have the capacity and don't need the capacity training that we often find foundations willing to support and everything have been a success and have been a marked success. Okay. Yes, really, um, my first observation would be that a lot of the changes that I've talked about actually come as a result of that constitutional section 35, the inclusion of indigenous rights. Without that, a lot of these things wouldn't happen. Um, but the first thing, come visit. Uh, we'll show you, and you'll see that the communities are divided. Some of them are doing very well, and some of them are doing very poorly. Uh, we have some very severe socioeconomic crises. Uh, we have a problem of endemic suicide, uh, epidemic suicide, where suicide rates eight to ten times the national national average in indigenous communities, and it is a huge crisis. So, second thing, um, without any change, the gap will get worse. 
if you don't fix this now and move toward a more positive, constructive, the only thing I can guarantee you is it'll get worse. Um, there's no, no evidence in Canada that our former policies were leading to sort of major improvements. There's lots of evidence that Indigenous empowerment leads to significant mm -hmm. improvements. One example, in the early 1970s, there were less than 1,000 Aboriginal people at all Canadian colleges and universities. There's now 30,000. And a lot of that is driven by communities that are investing their own money, oftentimes millions of dollars a year, to get their young people into post-secondary education. So that's the third thing, don't expect a panacea. You don't pass the constitutional change and see everything get better the next day. Um, Brian mentioned this, it's a multi-generational, it took hundreds of years to cause the <coughs> problem, it's gonna take generations to sort of get out of it. A Couple of things though, more fo focused. Um, indigenous business development is going through the roof. It's one of the fastest growing parts of the Canadian economy. Direct, a lot of it directing right back to Section 35 of the Constitution and the kind of process we've talked about right now. Job creation, particularly in the resource sector, is quite dramatic. Um, and the resource sector, kind of ironically, is the front lines of reconciliation. It isn't happening in urbi, ur, urban coffee shops. It's actually happening in mines where the indigenous people are getting, nothing wrong with urban coffee shops, my wife spends most of her life there. Um, but, but, you know, the, the Some job creation- Some of us represent places like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the job creation side is really important. That's actually starting to change the internal dynamics of communities in a whole bunch of ways. Consultation, as came out of these arrangements, did not stop economic mm. activity. There was this great fear that, boy, if you empower Aboriginal folks, no roads will get built, no mm. pipelines will get built, mm. all these kinds of things. And, it's, it hasn't happened. There's been, Aboriginal people have difference of opinions on these projects, mm -hmm. as everybody else does, but it hasn't ground everything to a halt, which is very important. We now have a situation where Indigenous communities have billions of dollars of investable assets that did not exist in the, in the mid-1980s. As a result of a whole series of processes sparked by Section 35, including resource revenue sharing, they have billions of dollars of investable assets. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things watching, they're buying back their land piece by piece by piece and taking economic control, which is a, a phenomenal transformation that has long-term, long-term significance. Do you want to make a comment on this? Yeah, very briefly asked specifically to, to the question. Thank you. Uh, in, in the Nordic countries, in the, Sam the Sami situation, it's not that uh, the Sami population is uh, social dis or economically disadvantaged. Uh, there, it's not. So the, the constitution uh, provisions that exist there are not geared to that. It's geared to a, the other kind of discrimination that you want to be different mm. to, to ensure that the Sami can pursue their way of life, uh, speak their kind of language, and, and, and so on. So that is not the, the constitution. It's towards the other side of the discrimination. And I would say if a, if a group as it seems to be the case, have for a long time been seriously socially and economically disadvantaged and there are no improvements. I would agree that I don't think a constitution will fix that. It's not a constitutional problem, it would seem to me. Uh, it's probably a, a worse kind of problem. Uh, that it's not a constitutional change that is needed, it's a mind change uh, when it comes to address when a country allows a certain part of the population to be disadvantaged in that kind of such mm -hmm. a long problem, uh, period of time. There are a different kind of change, I would think. I have a final question from Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. Um, can you um, touch on truth-telling, and that was one of the components, or is one of the components of the Uluru Statement. Um, I'm pretty certain Canada's had a process of truth-telling, um, Truth and Justice Commission. Um, can I ask how effective You've, was that uh, a useful exercise and how important was it in part of the journey? So Canada had a process called Truth and Reconciliation. It focused on residential schools. Um, we have a second one underway right now on missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, the first one exceeded everybody's expectations. The second one sadly has been engulfed in a whole bunch of controversy, um, although it's still proceeding. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission met with people all across the country. People talked about their experience in residential schools. Um, there were big public fora where there would often be hundreds and hundreds of non-Indigenous people coming and sitting and listening to Indigenous folks talk about their experience in residential schools. There was a formal apology that was also, I think it's two and a half million dollars, Brian, does that sound about right in terms of total compensation for people who were victimized in the residential schools? 
Um, it's interesting, it came up with 92 recommendations, and the one thing I would say to anybody on any committee is don't have 92 recommendations. <laughs> you know, maybe know. two, maybe three, but you get to 92, you, nobody pays mm -hmm. paying attention. Mm -hmm. But the federal government has mm -hmm. then announced when it was elected, so we're gonna implement all 92. And a bunch of us said, oh, please don't say that because you can't afford to do it and you won't do it. And so now they're admitting that they can't afford to do it and they won't do it. And, and so it's one of those interesting things where one of the biggest problems we have with governments that turn too fast the other direction is they raise the expectations mm -hmm. very high. However, tr reconciliation has become part of the national dialogue. People talk about it all the time. In schools, in hospitals, they talk about it in the police force, they, have, they talk about it in universities. Everybody is talking about what role people can play in reconciliation. It goes back to Matthias's point here about changing the conversation mm -hmm. and making the non-Aboriginal people responsible Quite frankly, it could be you know, truth-telling about for the racism that is an ins inherent part of Canadian society. And by, by getting the reconciliation conversation out there, I think it's had a fairly positive effect um, in actually changing the way people talk about Indigenous issues. Just to, uh, on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission, uh, two points. Uh, one is, uh, I think it was the last recommendation was directed at business and that uh, there should be a um, an actual um, uh, attempt with business to uh, deal with uh, social aspects of the employment and so forth uh, and that is was taken up by the mining council or the canadian mining uh, association in, in canada and uh, accepted it as a, as a platform for, for action. So even though it was one out of 94, they were prepared to do, do something with that. The second observation is that the, um, the present investigation into um, the mur murdered and missing Aboriginal women, which is the, uh, the one that uh, uh, was being talked about is uh, is torn by uh, a lot of uh, difficulties. Uh, it, some of these are because of the uh, personalities involved, but the, it also has uh, experienced uh, uh, the pressure from family communities, from family members, from family groups, that uh, they need to tell their story. And this has created a lot of uh, uh, pressure to get it done done in a reasonable mm. time frame and uh, there's been resignations from it there's all sorts of political uh, pressure but the government has agreed in the most recent uh, reaction to their demand for another two years the government has agreed to give them another six months and uh, that uh, I merely mention this as an illustration, there is enormous desire on the part of many families to have to tell their stories, and uh, it, it's it's a political reality. Uh, in a way, you're turning the ta the tap on. It's uh, it's sort of uncontrolled, mm -hmm. but at the same time, the public itself is getting to realize that the the missing the missing women are people. Are, are and need to be taken into into account. They need to be on our radar. Why why were there so many unsolved cases in the police system? You know. Um, Daddy, if you just limit your remarks to thirty Very, seconds, because yeah. we really yeah. No, I, I just yeah. wanted to say that um, as a, as an I was called as an expert witness to the missing and murdered indig Indigenous women and girls inquiry, a national inquiry, and uh, there were in as Brian has said, there were in excess of five hundred. Uh, individuals and families that still hadn't had the opportunity to testify. Nevertheless, I think that it, um, the establishment of the inquiry and setting aside the, the lack of a, a, of a substantive extension of their mandate um, has drawn a spotlight that is sorely needed. And these numbers, these numbers are not confined to the National Inquiry in Canada. They are across the Arctic. I know that for certain, and my my guess is that they exist elsewhere uh, for Indigenous women and girls. Well, can I thank you thank all you. for your attendance today? I think what has been particularly interesting is that First Nations people face similar histories in dealing with European peoples, that the challenges that they face are similar, uh, that there are different approaches. There is, as Ken says, no panacea, but 
Matthias' point about the importance of changing minds, I think, is at the heart of what we're trying to do. So thank you all for your attendance here, and I declare this public hearing closed. Thank you. Thanks.